Welcome to another episode of We're Talking Drums. I am your host, Corey Hoffing, and this is episode 64 of the podcast. If this is your first time tuning in, then thank you. Welcome. And I really hope you enjoy this conversation and you check out all the previous conversations that myself and other hosts have had with some amazing drummers. Don't forget, wherever you are streaming from, drop us a follow, a like, a subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, we have a brand new YouTube channel out where we will post videos of all of these podcast episodes as well. So make sure you check that out. And we're going to have a lot more awesome content on that channel coming up soon. So a little bit going on in my life is you can see maybe if you have uh, seen any of these podcasts before, I'm in a very different room than usual. Uh, But I am actually building a studio just next door. We're still under construction, but that will be the headquarters for the We're Talking Drums podcast, among many, many other things that I have planned for late in this year and next year. So I'm very excited about that. More to come on that. But for right now, we're talking drums. And this was a really phenomenal episode for me to do. Uh, It is with Mike Caputo, who plays for Brand of Sacrifice. But at this time, he was on tour filling in for the band Enterprise Earth. Me and Mike have been talking for several months at this point, trying to get together. I am a huge fan of his playing. His YouTube channel is super sick. He has so much awesome content, breakdowns of different techniques he uses. And the guy is just a gem of a human being. All right. I am. I feel so lucky that all the drummers that we've had on this podcast and every guest has just been such kind individuals, you know, and I have started to build like such great friendships with some of these guys, including last week's guest, Bryce Butler, who was super awesome. And I actually did this episode as well as the one with Bryce back to back. So it was on the same day they were touring together and it was super sick getting to hang out with these guys, chat drums, and just overall have a great time and saw a phenomenal show. So I hope that you really enjoy this. And if you do, don't forget to share this episode with your friends. Okay. You can tag us on Instagram. We are at We're Talking Drums. And make sure you tag our guests as well. Okay. They greatly appreciate it. We greatly appreciate it. We only want this podcast to grow. So that is the one way that you as a listener, if you really enjoy this podcast, that you can help us out. If you wanted to help out even further, if you wanted to be the dudest of dudes, we do have a Patreon as well. We release all of our podcasts early on our Patreon and I am starting to feel like I want to do more for our Patreon members. You guys have been so generous, so amazing. uh, And I want to do more for our Patreon community. So anywhere that you can, if you you want to just leave a comment, if you want to DM us on Instagram, if you want to send us an email, it is we're talking drums at gmail.com. Let us know what we can do for our Patreon members, what you guys want, what type of content do you want, you know, uh, aside from just the usual podcasts that we can provide you with. And, you know, I will do my best to make it happen. Okay. So without further ado, 
Here is my conversation with Mike Caputo. Mike Caputo, welcome to the We're Talking Drums podcast. How are you doing today, brother? I'm doing great. I just ate some food. I got a good night's sleep. I'm well rested and ready to go. Well, that's good. At least you're starting the tour off well. This is the second date on this tour with Shadow of Intent. Uh, now, you are playing drums for Enterprise Earth on this run. Correct. So how did that come to be? So I was on tour with Brandon Sacrifice a couple months ago. And Brandon, Enterprise Earth's drummer, was playing for Whitechapel. Right. And I was just kind of complaining that I was sitting at home doing nothing, basically, from the end of that tour in, when was that? August? Yeah. Like the beginning of August to January. Like, I'm just sitting at home doing nothing. And he was like, oh, funny enough, Enterprise <laughs> just got offered this tour, and I'm double booked with Whitechapel. So if you want to just go do the Enterprise tour so I can go do the Whitechapel tour, yeah, that then I'll do that. sweet of you, yeah. So I'm it. doing this tour, and he's doing the Whitechapel tour with, uh, I think it's BT Bam and Trivium. Oh, shit. So, nice, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're coming through Toronto soon, so. You should go see the show. They're pretty, oh, that whole dude, tour is pretty much will. following our tour. Yeah, so, yeah, I know. Uh, well, Alex Bent is a good friend of mine from Trivium, so I'll definitely be there to see him. That dude's a monster drummer. Dude, he's insane. I've been following that dude since he was in Archaic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing those videos, and then he joined Battlecross for a hot minute, mm -hmm. and we, my band Crimson Shadows did a small run with Battlecross. They're like good homies of mine. And just watching him soundcheck, and like just like going through like Samba grooves and like all this like awesome just drum nerd stuff yeah doesn't he you have know? like a gospel like, background too? oh yeah big time he's big so good time. yeah dude like he he's incredible i'm so i was so happy when he got that trivium gig i was like perfect that's a great good. gig yeah it's there seems to be a theme with like drummers who are just like really good at like overly good always get like these great gigs like they're i mean but they're very like i don't want to call them niche great gigs but like um like Eric Moore and Thomas Pridgen, like they got, they were playing for suicidal tendencies of all bands. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff where it's just like, they're just in a whole other universe. And then they're just like, I'm going to play for this punk band. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, Oh, fuck it's it. so sick. I know. Yeah. I love that. Fuck. Eric Moore is so good, man. Yeah. I can't stop watching his videos. I saw a video of Aaron Stakonner posted a story on his Instagram one time where he was just jamming with Eric Moore. Like he was just chilling with Eric and they were chopping out. And I was like, beyond jealous. Oh yeah. Like I would want to chop out with Eric Moore. He would absolutely just shred me under the table, but like yeah. just picking things up from him would be like the best. Yeah. I know. Anytime that I like jam with another drummer, they're always so much better than me, but I, you learn so much from it. Even you know? if it's less like jamming with people who are like, just starting or like newer mm -hmm. like you could still i find myself picking things up from like someone will do something no matter how advanced they are that i'll be like oh that's cool i want to steal that you right know? yeah 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 so, Always. and i find when you're like teaching people as well like i don't teach uh like for a living or anything like that but if anybody asks questions and you're explaining something you might not realize it but the more you explain things and start breaking stuff down, you're like, oh, all right, this is actually what I'm doing. Because a lot of the times, like, I just play by feel. Yeah, like, you I'm just, just like, Yeah, I, okay, well, now I have to do this. I know the sound I need to make, and that's this, 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 perfect. But when you start breaking it down and realizing what muscle groups are controlling what and everything like that, it's just like it opens whole new doors, you know, to, from you explaining something to someone else. Yeah, and right? even if it's, like, a faster technique, like, you know, stuff like push pull is like a, a technique that I use for like higher speeds, but um, having to slow it down and like the mechanics of it, yeah. like I never do that. And so um, there's a video on YouTube that I made. It was, it's like 60 seconds long and it's, um, I think it's just me. It's my phone like right here and I'm just, like okay this is what i'm doing and it's just slow like you just do this and then you do this and then you and do then this and, and i initially it. made it for uh, a friend of mine and um i posted it in a discord 
and um a few other people saw it and it was unlisted and they were like oh this is actually decent and you know yeah because it's a decent angle and you can see what's happening right yeah and uh so i was like oh, i'll just make it public whatever and then like it got a decent reception so i may do more little things like that where i same thing with like heel toe and whatnot like it's yeah. just it's just a fast technique yeah. you can't slowing it down is hard but when you slow it down you get like into the nitty gritty of it, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the double strokes. And like, I just talked to Bryce for like fucking I'm, half an hour about double I'm strokes. I'm scared for him but. for this tour. Like he's, <laughs> he's like, man, I've only been playing doubles for like a couple weeks. I'm going to just, I'm just going to do it. Right. Um, and I, I saw your, uh, recent, uh, video about the double strokes and, and you saying like, okay, well, I think it took you like three or four months to really, uh, dial it in and and then you had a great breakdown of it on on different bpm levels and everything like that as well yeah and like i learned a lot from watching how your feet move and everything because i'm in the process of tightening up my doubles yeah. but not at the point where like i, I don't typically play over like 220 mm. for anything yeah. so I, I can do that with my swivel no problem but i'm just concerned like because uh, I've been playing for so long, my left knee has been causing me issues, and I'm like, I think I want to switch to doubles. Doubles are the way. Or if Dude, you want to, really is. If you want to still do singles, you can be really swag about it and do like constant release singles, like the Wanja Groger thing. Right, right. But right. it's just it takes way longer uh, to do than learning doubles. Yeah. But the payoff is that you're still playing singles, and at least in my experience, you can play them way harder. Then okay. you can like double strokes. Yeah. Like Wanja's singles are loud. Yeah. But I I do honestly, I'm not overly concerned about that. It's just like making sure everything's tight. Now just hitting to... the notes and not jacking your knee up anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But like most of my stuff's around two hundred. And honestly, for me though, it is like it's a stop and starts. You know? That's really hard, yeah. That's that's the thing that I still have to get tight with the doubles. For, which... for me, it's not so much the stops anymore, but it's definitely the starts. I find my starts are a, the spacing on my first four notes. Like yeah. two to four notes, the that's spacing it. is a little wonky. Like you might hear it today. It's just kind of, a, especially in like live settings where I don't get to, like you get one shot and you do it. You can't and record it, it over and over, you right? know? Yeah. So you, you may hear it. I, I kind of have a tendency to smush them together a little bit, which I need to work on. Yeah, but honestly, live setting and how fast you go, mm. it's like that's over like that and you're right into it. And <laughs> The Enterprise stuff, actually, funny enough, it isn't that fast, but there are, there's a lot of, there's a part in They Have No Honor that I usually use double strokes for mm -hmm. and it's like little bursts um, just because it's a balance thing for me i can do it singles but i find myself having to like float more and like sit up yeah instead of just like i could sit here and just stomp my feet a couple times you know yeah yeah, yeah um yeah, absolutely but there are parts in the set that are like tripleted like 16 no triplets mm -hmm. and uh just because i just it's fun i just go up to 30 seconds like i pick and choose my spots strategically <laughs> you'll hear it i yeah. do it in i didn't scars of the past and then, um, which isn't like super duper fast, mm -hmm. it's still fast. But um, and then I do it in re, um, what's that song? Reanimate, disintegrate. That one's like dumb. Like it's pretty quick. <laughs> and Dakota, the bass player, always gives me like the side eye because yeah, he'll like try cool. and pick with me, oh. just like as a joke. And yeah, he can't. He yeah. can't. He can't keep up. No, 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 no. <laughs> dude. And bass player, come on, like play half. Play half of it. I mean, he could do the triplets. You know? Like, he does the triplet thing. Like, yeah. no problem. But it just that one notch up is yeah. f way fast. Yeah. So I'm excited to hear that today. Yeah. It's hopefully I don't flub it now that I spoiled it. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're talking about it and yeah. you just fucking botch that whole part. Dude, I, I mean, that's, that's the easy part of that song. That song is, that song took me a little bit. There's one part in the middle that there's like this weird, like, symbol pattern thing that happens. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up having to, in like in my reference tracks that I listened to, I listened to Click and then I listened to like the full CD audio with drums and vocals and everything. Yeah. Um, just because it helps me feel like at home. I can just, if I'm freaking out or whatever, I can just close my eyes and be like, all right, I'm in my bedroom and just 
yeah chill that's it you always um, have a reference to where you're supposed to be but that everything. part's so weird and i couldn't learn it exactly so i actually cut that part out in the reference and i have a drumless version just for that section and then all the drums come back in afterwards oh so, shit, eh? and same thing with uh psalm of agony there's a drum solo at the end and um i play the very beginning like brandon does mm -hmm. and then it just goes off the rails because brandon's a, a he marched for the blue devils oh, yeah. so he's got ridiculous patterns that he knows and his orchestration is crazy so i was just like all right i can't solo against another solo like and i can't learn that solo so i'm just gonna cut the drums out Oh yeah, dude, that'd be so hard if you're you're trying to do a solo and there's another solo on top of it. Yeah, I was like ears? sending them videos to oh, like be God. like, all right, I learned the song. Here's the video of me playing the song, and I'm like soloing against this solo, and it just sounds like a mishmash of. Just, oh yeah, dude. But I'm like, trust me, it's there. It's fine. Like it'll be fine once that isn't there. It's yeah, it's good. It's yeah. good. And then we yeah. played it in rehearsal. It's it's fine. But it's one of those things where I don't have, I'm not very regimented with solos and fills and stuff mm -hmm. so yeah. every night it's different so you're gonna get you know the first last night is gonna be completely different from today and it's not because yeah. i just throw my limbs at shit and it's hopefully works yeah everything stays on on time you're good there's but... two accents i have to hit there's like a tom part don't don't do bah, like that's it yeah i have to hit one in the middle and then the one at the end and that's it everything they're just like do whatever yeah so yeah i just do whatever <laughs> that's awesome well i i'm the same way even with songs i've been playing for fucking 10 years i'm like ah i i, I want to do this fill this time yeah, just change you know? it up like whatever it's not a big deal as long as it works only know? only a few times does it not work and i have to like catch back up into the next part oh I'm yeah like, oh, okay. that most of the time is rehearsal that i'm just like trying something new or just like doing way too much yeah you know live i'll usually tame it back and be like okay now i need to be good because people are actually watching yeah <laughs> you know i'll i'll pull new things out live like with my band desecrate the faith um it's pretty i wrote it all so it's pretty i pretty much play the same thing all the time but yeah if i want to do something new i'll do it in rehearsal first and mm -hmm. then if i'm not confident with it i'll just do the old thing live until i am comfortable with it and then at a later date i'll pull it out but most of the time with that band stuff that i write i play it the same every time yeah stuff that other people write i play the meat and potatoes like pretty much the same yeah and then course, um yeah. certain fills if i feel like the fill is like really important like um when i was in rings we would play margita mm -hmm. and there's that transitionary fill into that two-step riff you know like that riff i would play that fill the same every single night i learned it exactly like the album it's exactly the same yeah every other fill whatever doesn't matter it's yeah. they're not as important but yeah. that one's super duper important but that one it like it, it allows something. you to like get the right feel going into the next exactly. part right and everybody can like feel that as well on yeah. stage so it's just like you want to do that every single night as yeah perfect as possible. there's there's yeah. a part like that in the the last song we're going to play tonight um there same thing it's just it's the drums by itself usually it's these fills that i learned exactly are when it's like just drums mm -hmm. and um yeah there's one in particular on this you know in this set where i'm like i have to play this exactly and it's not something i ever would have thought of but it's brandon so it's like yeah you know it was weird it's awkward to play for me but it sounds sick so i do it yeah so you do it yeah yeah, yeah. all right um all right so we're talking about everything happening right now why don't we go back when did you first pick up the sticks and and start playing drums okay so there's two parts to this the first one i was <clears throat> i was like five years old five or six and my uncle gave me like a vintage ludwig kit and i was i had shown zero interest in drums i was just a hyper kid yeah and um i lived in new york and we have basements there um i live in texas now and there is no basements but in new york we put it in the basement and i was just smack like zero 
direction. Just get down there and hit stuff and then yeah, whatever. Because hitting stuff is fucking fun. It's as fun. Shit, yeah. So I'm like, six years old. It's right. Just, it's, the, it's the most fun yeah. anybody could ever have at that age. Yeah. yeah. And then um I was a demon child and I decided to just stab holes in the drum heads. Um there was another thing I did similar when I took books out from the library and I decided to just rip pages in half out of the books. Nice. Okay. Um, it seems to be a pattern when I was a kid. <laughs> but yeah, I stabbed a bunch of holes in the the drum heads and my parents, I guess, didn't realize that you can replace those. So they just threw the whole kid away. Oh, holy um, shit. And then I didn't Jesus. touch drums until I was like, how old was I? I was like 12 or 13. Um, my parents got me this it's the Yamaha DD55 or DD50. It's like a tabletop electric drum kit that Yamaha oh, makes. Okay, that just has like the four or five. It's pads a big box with it. the pads on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah gotcha. And so I got one of those for my birthday. It was either my birthday or Christmas, and um, I messed with it for a little bit, and then I just kind of put it to the side. Mm -hmm. And then one day, I realized that there's songs like pre-programmed into it. So I was like listening to the songs and I was just like pushing buttons on it. And I was like, oh, you can pull the song away and just listen to the drums. So I would just listen to the drums and then you could push even more buttons and pull certain parts of the drums away. So I could hear just the kicks or just the cymbals or just the, oh, wow. the snare and toms. Yeah. So I like was bored one day and I just like did like pieced it together and started like mimicking what i was hearing basically mm -hmm. and my parents thought i was just listening to all the songs and i was playing them all so they were like oh we should probably get him some lessons or something so yeah 13 i started taking lessons uh, because of a crappy electric drum kit that i had <laughs> That's awesome, man. And like you just took lessons at like nearby music store. Yeah, it was like a local music store in Long Island called Family Melody. Um, it was like in the basement of this music store. And then um I actually tapped the dude out for like everything he could teach me. He was after like a couple years, he was like, I can't teach you anything anymore. Like I don't know what to yeah. what to go with. Cause he played in like um like a hippie rock band and all that. So he was like a rock drummer and you know, yeah. and you're like, but blast beats, man. Yeah, yeah I, I like, just honestly like towards the end there, I just found out about like Hate Eternal and Derek Roddy, so I was like, I want to do this, and he's and like, uh, I can't, I like, can't do that. He's like, I have no <laughs> idea, no idea what's happening. Yeah, so he <laughs> sent me to his teacher, um, on the other side of town. Nice a guy named Frank Mediati. I actually still talk to him sometimes, and uh, he owns the music store actually that that um my original teacher sent me to mm -hmm. he didn't own it at the time he just taught there and then he bought it out so it's cool he owns the location now which is sick but yeah i went to him for maybe like a year year and a half and then i ended up moving to to houston um i took lessons with this guy named craig lemay for like six months or a year craig's awesome he's written a bunch of books and stuff um and then i we ended up not being able to afford lessons anymore because it's like an hour or more across town. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. we were just like, yeah, we're sorry, can't do it anymore. And so I just did self taught from then on. And that was like, I was like 16, 17, something there. So, hey, that, that's not bad. You got like what, like a, a solid four, four years, four to five, yeah, four to five years of learning in there. Yeah. That's pretty good. Better than me. I didn't start playing until I was 18. And uh, no lessons here, man. Dude, it's. Dude, I wish. I well, wish I had lessons. It's never too day. late, dude. I, there was a lady who lived. Um, and when I lived in my old house, there was a retirement, like an active living retirement community mm -hmm. directly behind my house. And um, my grandparents actually ended up moving in there. And there's a lady who was like 89 or 90 years old. And she one day was just like, I want to learn to play drums. So she started taking drum lessons at 89 years old. And then she started a polka band with like all of her kids and her grandkids. And they would play every year they'd play the New Year's party at the retirement home. So that I would go so I would sad. go there and watch her just oompa like just all all night. It was sick. Dude, that's so sick. I will say, all right, so to reiterate though, I have taken two lessons. Okay. I started taking lessons uh from like friends of mine and stuff. Uh Another, uh, we're talking drums alumni, uh, Chris Stevenson. Mm. He's a teacher. I took a lesson from him. And I also took a lesson from Ash Pearson Ash as well. Ash is great. Ash, like, it, dude, it blew my mind. Like, 
10 minutes into the lesson, I was just like, oh my God, I know nothing about my instrument. He knows so much. Dude, and and he's insane. like the nicest dude ever, too. Oh, yeah. It was incredible. I wanted to keep taking more from him, but then with tour and, and finances and everything, I was just yeah. like, fuck. So Between I, the two of you guys, like, like touring and all that, like oh, yeah, dude. getting together and all that must be a nightmare. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it really is. But hopefully, hopefully once he's back home, and I'm like settled into a new place and everything. I want to start up lessons again because I learned so much just from that one lesson. Yeah. It's insane. It's crazy yeah. too that like they can get you like you can find your way on your own. Mm -hmm. But having someone there to immediately go, no, do this. Right. Like that's makes like, dude, if I had someone there to tell me because I started learning like death metal stuff on my own. Like yeah. I had my foundations and whatnot with a, like actual lessons but death metal and fast drumming was all all me and youtube basically yeah. and like the Derek roddy forums and the, the george <laughs> colliers forums like i'm 31 that was like my my oh, shit yeah. was oh, like yeah. those forums and uh if someone had just told me talk hey tuck your elbow in because you're doing this chicken wing thing yeah i wouldn't have cubital tunnel right now right because it took me developing a medical problem to be like, I should probably fix this. You right? know, yeah, if someone was just like, Hey, don't do that. You know, it, yeah. I, it, I got to the same spot, but lessons would have got me there quicker, you know? Yeah. And with less injuries. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. have had a, you know, I'm American. So I, the doctor looked at me for like five minutes and was like, cool, that'll be $300. And, yeah. You know, You're so like, oh, yeah, it'd be like that sometimes, but yeah, you live yeah. and you learn. Luckily here in Canada, we have uh free, healthcare yeah. not exactly free but I mean, you know yeah <laughs> i it was a bummer because i developed it right after i quit my job to do rings full-time oh, so shit. i lost my health insurance like uh when did i quit i quit the end of april so may 1st basically i lost my health insurance mm -hmm. and i think it was june is when that happened holy fuck. so yeah so the best like, timing ever oh yeah yeah quit your job and then you yeah. end up with this shit yeah fuck. it's like oh you have health insurance oh not anymore yeah. all right here's all your medical problems now <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. and it's all from doing your new job yeah yeah <laughs> right so that's fuck. a bummer dude but yeah like i said whatever it helped me fix my technique so my hand yeah. my wrist and everything and my elbow aren't as bad anymore mm -hmm. so well, I had to do the same with my feet because I was just like a straight single player for so long. But then I started noticing stuff in my ankles where because I was tensing up to play as fast as I needed to, that I was like, I, I can't keep playing like this. And this is like in my early 20s. Yeah. And I'm like, this is no good. So then I learned the swivel technique and like just say as loose as possible and everything got better which what so which one of the swivels are you doing because i know there's like two different ones there's like the one that george does where it's like the ankle thing and you just kind of move yeah and then like the guys like ken and uh like eugene they do like the pressure one yeah it's more the the pressure swivel it was actually ken that got me onto it originally okay uh so yeah th that's that's what i've been with for the last like fucking eight years okay yeah, so i do like pressure swivel on my right foot and then my left foot just kind of floats and does the the flick ankle flick thing. Yeah. Um. When I do singles, anyway, that's kind of what happens. Yeah. But, but you're so, all doubles these I, days, man. I do both. Yeah, depends. you flow there's, between. There's, yeah, it depends on the speed and how long. You know. Yeah. Also, also, after tours, especially with brand, um, there's no part in the brand set list that's longer than like one bar that i can do with singles um, oh yeah yeah everything is doubles so like the last tour we did we did one with after the burial and um uh Thyre's murder it was like their co-headlining tour mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, i ended up uh we did that and then we did as lay dying right after so it was like two and a half or three months and i came back and my singles are just shot yeah and so now my singles are garbage yeah. Like I can, I can, I can hang at like 200 or 205, but like 210, it starts getting rough. Yeah. So, oh, shit, and they were, they were at like 220, 225 before I left. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, now it's, it's a bit harder, but there's a couple spots in the enterprise set that are, I can 
do singles. So I tr- I try and do singles for those so I can at least upkeep a little bit. Yeah, that dude, that's another thing about touring is everyone's like, oh, you're playing every day. Like, yeah, you're playing the same thing every the day. Sa- the same thing. So you you're really good at that. Good at that. Yeah. <laughs> but like, dude, after being on tour, I was like, yeah, I'm good if I have to play those songs. Like to play a set, I'm yeah, I can hop in, no problem. But like as an actual drummer, I'm terrible right now. Yeah, dude, I'm if awful. You, if you told me, like, dude, I haven't played a Rings of Saturn song since like 2020. Yeah. Like if you told me play the easiest ring song in the set, I couldn't do it right now because I haven't played a song since 2020. You right? know? Yeah. Like I may be, you may look and be like, oh, he's better than he's ever been. It's like, yeah, but I don't remember how to play any of that. And my right. body isn't used to that anymore. Right. So it's very, very different. Ask me to yeah. play the Enterprise Air set list. It'll be fine. Yeah. Because you, know? you, you got that dialed yeah, in, yeah. man. Brand yeah. set list. Fine. Yeah. You know? Even on day two, you got it. So like That's yesterday, okay. <laughs> yesterday was the first show that you played with them. Yeah, right. And that went smooth. You got how many it rehearsals? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't okay. think I did. I don't think I did that well. But um, I, there were people that were like, "You guys stole the show," and blah blah blah. Oh, and like shit. every other people were like, "That sounded awesome," blah blah blah. And I was like, "If you say so." Yeah, but man. That's why we're like, always our own worst critics. Fans, you yeah. just smile and nod. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. That's it. <laughs> Meanwhile, in your head, you're like, oh my God, that was fucking terrible. Oh, like, oh, yeah. dude. That's me almost every show. Yeah. No matter how good I play, mm-hmm. if I miss one thing, I'm like, it's the worst show ever. Worst. Yeah. yeah. You miss one bell hit. And it's just like, oh my God. It sticks in my brain forever. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's it. That's the musician's curse, man. Yeah. That's I mean, it. but that's how you get I feel like that's how I got better was yeah. being like I hate how I sound right now. Yeah. And then like it's, it's so I think John Longstreth said um as you get fast it's pretty much the same thing as like as you get faster, it's never quite fast enough. Right. Because like I dude, I wanted to be able to play like 250 BPM since I was like 15, 16 years old. Yeah. And now that I can do it, I'm like, oh man, I just want to go faster now. Like, you know, and I want to clean up my, you know, in that range, I want to clean up 250 or whatever. But um, it's never, I could play robotically tight and I would still find something wrong. Yeah. You know, well, it's the same thing as like, oh, like w- when you're in a smaller band, you're like, oh, if only we could play to like, get like get on a tour and be playing to 200 people every night and then you go and you do that and then you're like uh well now i want 400 and now i want a thousand and like it's never enough there is no ceiling on that you always want more you always want to be better you always want to be faster yeah like that's that's what and that's what pushes you to become better as a whole if you got like complacent in your playing then that's uh, boring right like yeah you know, that's how I end up like to me that I used to work at Guitar Center and I would see all these guys that were like working the plants and stuff. And they're like, I've been playing 40 years. And they're just like, you know, I mean, that's cool, you know. Hey, that's, but, hey man, if that makes you happy. If, then... Yeah, but they just play the same thing all the time. They yeah. go practice and they play the same like 20 songs and then that's it. They don't work on anything new or learn any new songs or anything. They're just like, I play the same songs from the 80s and the, the 70s. Like, yeah, back when music was good. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Okay, dude. All right. Yeah, cool, man. Go, go play your bar gigs and make your money. You're probably making more money than I am. So that's go for it. That's accurate. Yeah. yeah I can't really <laughs> talk shit. So. Yeah, man. Uh, like for me, I, I, I talked to... Um, Dave McIntosh, the old drummer of Dragon Force. Uh, we played with them like back in like 2011 or 12, I think. And it kind of stuck with me because I was like really upset with my performance that night. And he said after the show, he's like, listen, you're never going to be happy with your performance and use that to get better. But don't get so hard on it that it hinders you from continuing. Like just use it to get better. And realize that when you play in a band it's how the whole band comes across so as long as the band as a whole sounds great and the fans love it like let that small things let them kind of go no you need to work on them but also like don't let don't get too upset over the small shit during your set yeah the fans should be the deciding factor and like how the whole group sounds exactly and also like i i've done things like on stage where I've been 
I've said to myself, that was like really bad. Yeah. And then a fan posts a video of it and I go back and look and I'm like, that's where I said that to myself and I didn't hear anything. And you don't hear anything. Yeah. It's weird. It's like a parallel universe or some shit. Like, cause I've done that too, where I've been recording and I had the opposite where I was like, oh, I fucking ripped that. That was so good. And I listened back to it. I was like, that was the worst thing I've ever played. <laughs> right. And then you play through something and it's like, oh, fuck, that wasn't very good. And then you're like, oh, actually, sounds exactly how I want it. To. Dude, I have that happen what? with live shows. And uh, it's kind of, this is something kind of similar where um, live shows and recording, um, like the first couple shows or the first couple takes, I'll make mistakes that I've never made before. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And every show is a new way to find, uh, is a new chance to find a way to fuck up. Yeah. And yeah. like I recorded, uh, like when I, when I record at home, um, like the last desecrate CD, which isn't out yet, but it's coming out in like two months, which is dope yes. or a month. Um, finally after like three and a half, four years, but, <laughs> um, I'm listening back to the, the tracks that we recorded. And I was like, did I really play that? Like that Tom Phil there? I've never played that there ever. And they were like, it's there. You played it. And I was yeah. like, well, I didn't mean to play that. So but we're going to have to redo it now. Not That's even. It. It's like, like... We, it's like weeks <laughs> later. So I'm like, well, how many takes do you have of that? And they're like, three or four and i'm like okay let's go through all of them and go figure that's the one that's the most solid yeah and it's the only course. one with that on it so i'm like all right we're keeping that i guess that's in the song now yeah i guess that's Whatever. it man yeah. it, i'm in the same way even like in late mixing stages of a record and i'm like ah oh, i didn't uh, did i really play it like yeah, I that i don't remember that like <laughs> what was i doing in the studio that like that was the take that we kept okay fine you know Whatever. I'm going to play it however I want live anyway. Yeah, so. it's my music. It's I'll fine. do whatever I want. It's an artistic <laughs> choice. It's an artistic choice. That's it, yeah. man. Yeah, fuck, dude. Something I've, I've found saying to my... Um, I've actually said this multiple times the last two days is if you play the wrong thing once, it's a mistake. If you do it twice, it's jazz. It's jazz. And, or it's on purpose. You did it on purpose. Yeah. Just play the same thing, even if it's wrong, do it again. Yeah. As far as anybody else knows... You meant to do that because you did yeah. it twice in a row. I'll do that. Like if you're going through a verse riff and it repeats multiple times and I fuck up the first one, I'll do it the second time too. Yeah. I'll like, fuck it. Yeah. No. Consistency. I, yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Nobody if it's is the wiser. That's the song. That's it, man. Yeah. Fuck. I love that. That's, That's such sick. a, yeah. Ever <laughs> since I started thinking that way, I've definitely been very, uh, it's, it's changed my mentality a bit. Same thing with the, like, don't be so hard on yourself. Like, the crowd, like, realizing that the crowd hears differently than you do because you're sitting right there. Yeah. You know, the, but and the crowd you, hears everything. And you have full in ears and everything. Yeah. Right. You hear, so, like, every little nitty gritty yeah. thing. Whereas the crowd is just like, I'm here and I'm loving it. And that's, that's it. That's it, man. As so, long as you're putting out the energy. And for me, like, I, I like to have fun when I'm playing. Yeah. You know, like, the older I get, the more I'm like, Man, I put way too much pressure on myself it, back in the day. And I ended up playing so many shows where it's just like, I wasn't having a fun time. Why am I playing music? Why am I on tour if I'm not having fun with my friends? You know, getting on stage and you're just stressed out. Like, so more recent years, I'm like, no, I'm having fun. We're going to, we're going to play a great show. And if I'm relaxed and I go into it with that kind of energy, I always play better. You know, like that's just, I don't know why, but if I get, if I'm less stressed and I'm just like, I'm going to have a fun time, I'm going to fucking do windmills. I'm going to like wink at the crowd and like make funny faces and just like try to connect with the audience rather than just like being in my bubble of like, I play drums, I need to play everything perfect. But like just that human connection. Yeah. That's like what I, I crave now from playing live, especially having two years of, no shows yeah you know now that i'm back like touring and doing shows everything i want to connect with people because we didn't have that during yeah that time dude that right? sucks so bad it was the fucking worst i just was getting drunk and playing warzone every day and right that was my whole existence yeah i had to quit drinking for two years because i was like fucking this sucks i did the so opposite much, i didn't right? drink i didn't drink a ton but like dude yeah. for me it was like every day i would just play Warzone with my friends and just get hammered. And I'm like, oh, this is a problem. 
Yeah, like, right. And then finally, <laughs> like, I finally, like, August 2021, I got the opportunity to do a tour. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't drink a whole lot that tour. So that kind of, like, reset me. Yeah, you're like, okay, no, this, I, I'm okay. Everybody at that time was drinking way too much. Yeah. They were, so people a, were either drinking way too much or not at all. Right. People got like really bad or like super healthy. Yeah. There was no zero in between. I did I did I both. So right off the top, I just like went ham on the drinking cuz I was working like 80 hour weeks before that and getting super burnt out. So I was like, wait, I I got no work, I got nothing. I'm just going to fucking just party. party. I, it was an immaculate summer here. I had a pool, so it was just like 2 in the afternoon. It's time for some drinks. Pool beers, dude. Yeah. 3 months of that though, and I was like, all right, no, I got to I, I'm heading down a dark path here, yeah. <laughs> you know? So I started playing drums way more, getting into like audio production and, and running and got super healthy and then went on tour again. Yeah. And I, it was like, oh shit, here comes the drinks. <laughs> yeah. I, I typically, when I'm on tour, I don't drink a ton really because most mm-hmm. of the tours I do are van tours. Right. So I have no toilet. So I, you know, I'm like, I'd rather not drink so I don't have to ask the guys to pull over like every 45 minutes or whatever right right right, um, right and we can actually get where we're going at a decent time yeah but um when i'm home I'll, I'll go out to shows and have some some beers you know whatever but this tour i think i'm gonna do pretty much completely sober i may have like one or two if we have like a day off somewhere or something yeah. and we're just chilling yeah otherwise i'm just it's business and, it's business yeah and you're a hired gun too so it's like you yeah, want to kind of play it straight and yeah i mean I, i'm always sober when i play always every yeah. show you've any show you've ever seen me play on video in person whatever i'm always 100 percent sober like i don't mm-hmm. drink the entire day it's yeah. just only water and then if i do drink it's i get off stage and i have like one two yeah exactly like just something to relax with after the show yeah yeah absolutely but if we have like a bandwagon or a a bus like if we're in europe you know there's a toilet there so i can you know i can i can have a couple more and like i don't have to worry about like like i said pulling over a bunch i can just like roll out of bed and just whatever exactly yeah yeah, it's operation continues as usual the nice thing about uh the last tours i did in europe was we had hotels every night so we only usually had about half hour 45 minute drive and then we're at the hotel yeah that's sick so i was like all right perfect like yeah yeah, get to the hotel take a nice hot shower shower beer dude dude shower beer and after show showers with a beer is like it's awesome uh, it's it's heaven That's what heaven would be. We did the Spirit Box show in Anaheim uh, in August, mm-hmm. and there was a shower backstage, and I was like, "Yes, shower beer, dude!" Like, right that. off stage, get your drums away, shower beer. And oh no, it wasn't even backstage. It was at the hotel. We went back to the hotel. It was like, um, um, yeah, we went back to the hotel and had a shower beer at the hotel. Yeah. And it was dope. See, that's the best because you don't need to worry about doing anything after that. You can just like, all right, toss on a pair of underpants, hop into bed, chill. Like, yeah. We did. W- over. When Riggs Perfect. went to Australia, um, I would room with Lucas every night. And me and him are pretty much the same in, in that we like to just go to bed. Like, we're not going to go out and party or whatever. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. going to, we'll sit in the hotel room, we'll be on our phones and then go to bed. Right. Yeah. So, but I would like take beers from the venue that we played and like, shower beer and right right yeah bed on my phone for a bit bed. that's it man yeah one or two beers at the hotel and you're fucking golden yeah Yeah. i love it man it's sick yeah all right uh let's wrap this up because you got to get going uh the last thing i want to end on is i am curious what the worst on stage disaster you have ever had i know immediately like Immediate- there, is, there is no second guessing this at all. Okay, so perfect then. We're, it's a Rings of Saturn tour. It's the Planetary Duality tour in Brooklyn at Brooklyn Bazaar, which doesn't exist anymore. Okay. We're, we had just been in Canada for a few days. And this was um, when Lucas wasn't touring with the band. We had uh, Yo Onitan on guitar. And he couldn't get into Canada because he was like on a visitor's visa for the US. He's Japanese. Okay. So yeah. he was, we left him in the US. Me, Joel, and Ian went to Canada and we played a different set. We were playing uh, Infused that whole tour, 
but, mm-hmm. and it's got a Rusty Cooley solo at the end of it. Yeah. And Yo knows how to play it. Um, but when we went to Canada, we cut that song because like Joel doesn't know how to play the solo and Yo knew how to play it. So yeah. we're so like, like, we'll ah, just we'll just not play the song, right? Perfect. Done. So we get into New York and we pick Yo up and we go to the show and we play the show. And um first of all, um the stage was like uneven. Yeah. So every time I would like go I would play my kick like quick. Yeah. Um it would be fine and then if I stomp down at all the bass drum would do the thing where it like lifts up. Oh yeah, okay. Cuz the Perfect. back of the pedal is like off the ground. Off the ground. Oh yeah. my god. I hate that. So it that was worst. happening and yeah. I had to like put um drumstick sheaths. I had to fold them up and put them under my my pedal like yeah. mid set. Like under the the front of the pedal. Under the front of the Lift pedal. the that yeah. yeah okay, so gotcha. Yeah. I did that. I finally figured it out. Right after I figured it out, we were supposed to play infused. Mm-hmm. And I forgot that it was there because uh, we were playing. Because you weren't playing we were it. Playing a different <laughs> in song. Canada, yeah. So I heard. I don't get in my ears. No one says what the next song is. Okay. Um, so I just start hearing the click track, and I'm like, "This is a different click track from the last four days or three days that we played." Yeah. So I just froze. Uh, I just froze. I didn't even count in. I was just. I have no idea what's happening. Yeah. And so it's just 808, and then bass tracks. And then oh it's just God. one by one we all just come in because we're like, what the what just happened? You know? And so Yo comes in and then Joel comes in and then I come in and then Ian comes in. And then by the time that happens, it's like we're, you know, 15, 20 seconds into the song. Yeah. And it was it was so awkward, dude. Like I I had never been more disappointed in myself after a set mm-hmm. in my life. Yeah. Dude, that, that's one of those you just have a brain fart and it's just like this isn't the same as last night well now uh. that show is the reason except for this tour i ha- always have a set list i don't yeah. care how well i know the set yeah i have always. it and i can look at it this set yeah. luckily there's like uh pre-roll for every song where there's like an intro that has no drums yeah so i can just listen to that and no, okay, we're playing this song now. Yeah, you know, perfect. There's no just click. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. And like that was the thing when I was on tour with Striker, and the first time I had ever had it. Uh, like, a everybody was on the click. Yeah. Right. Um, and we ran a Reaper session. So before the song came in, you'd hear the click start. Then they actually like use a mic and made tracks and said the name of each song yeah so it comes in and then it says the name of the song like the front and so everybody knows it's the front we didn't yeah. need set lists all tour because even when we switch the setup they're like i don't care it tells me what song i'm about to play yeah so it's perfect that's i started with rings i started writing the set list on my snare drum i actually so i did that before i filled in for the zenith passage and i did mm-hmm. that i wrote the zenith set list on my snare and I was still, right I didn't, there. and I didn't finish learning one of the parts for one of the songs. So I wrote like all the time signatures next to the song title because uh-huh. I knew exactly which part it was. So it had yeah. like all these numbers next yeah. to it. I did that on set list because I had to learn set in like a couple of weeks or whatever. And I literally wrote the set list out. And then beside everything, I'd have the small little parts and pauses that I needed to remember. And it took like two or three shows in. I was like, okay, I don't need that anymore. I did that but, with the Traders. I, yeah. I learned their set. They called me three days before the European tour started with Rings on the, the Jadim one in 2020. Yeah. Uh, right. Steven called me and was like, hey, I know tour starts in like three days, but I can't do it. Can you just play the set? And... And I was like, sure. I'm just, I'm the say yes guy. Yeah. So say yes and was, figure it out I was later, like, yep, man. Sure. I got it. No yeah. problem. So, like, two days nonstop just learning the songs. And then I, I had a binder full of just every song had its own page and just, I would flip and there's the next song. Okay. Read it. I wouldn't even look up at the crowd. I would just read, play and read the song. Yeah. And then that was it. And then after yeah. like a week or so, it was fine. Yeah, right. you got through it and you learned them literally on the fly. Yeah, they're fun yeah. songs too. So yeah, it was cool. Hells yeah, man. All right. Well, thank you 
Mike, for coming on the We're Talking Drums podcast, sitting down with me and having a chat. No problem. It's been a long time coming. I it mean, has. It has, it's really. Yeah. Been months we've been trying to do this. As soon as I saw that you were playing for Enterprise Earth, I was like, fuck, this could work out great. So I'm glad that we got to do this and enjoy the rest of your tour, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We're talking drums.